Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. God. I believe what God says because it is impossible impossible. for God to lie. Today, I'd like to talk to you about one of the things that are very important in your Christian life, and that is this, understanding the rules and the laws within the realm of the Spirit. Now, in the physical realm, we have laws. There's laws on the highway, speed limit, 70. I like down in Oklahoma right now, speed limit, 80. That's nice. But the laws can work for you, and the laws can work against you. If you're a law-abiding citizen, you're driving down the road, and you're doing the speed limit or less at a proper rate, and you're driving sanely, then you are protected. (laughs) But when you break the law, see, somebody somewhere, some engineer somewhere, tested that road. And they said, this road is safe at 45. This road is safe at 60. This road is safe at 70. Somebody has tested it. And when you operate within the safety limits, there's a greater chance that you're going to be safe. Because if you're traveling 70 miles an hour, in a 30 mile an hour zone, and it looks like everything's fine, what you may not realize is there's a sharp turn just around the corner that you don't have time to slow down for. Follow the rules. There's natural laws, gravity. Gravity can work for you. We're all sitting in our seats and not floating around in the room because of gravity. If gravity would cease to exist, but gravity works for us. It it allows us to get traction so that we can walk. Natural laws. There are spiritual laws. And one of the main spiritual laws, and there are other laws that fall within this law, but one of the main spiritual laws is the law you know what it is? Of binding and loosing. See, as Christians, this world is not our home. We're just passing through. We are citizens of a different kingdom. And we are under the laws, spiritually, of that kingdom. But the laws of that kingdom override the laws of this kingdom because this kingdom on earth, the physical world, was created out of the spirit world. See, when people make statements like, well, I just need to get back to reality, and they think about, I need to get back to thinking about earth. No, no. Earth is not the reality. The reality is the realm of the spirit. Now, you can look it up in the Bible. The Bible says everything that is, was created that you see was created out of something that you don't see. What you don't see affects what you do see. And Christians have been given authority to operate in the spiritual realm of binding and loosing. Now, let's take a look at uh, a scripture. Matthew 16, 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, in other words, the power of death, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind, and that word bind in the Greek can also mean forgive. This is verse 19. For whatever you bind or you forbid on earth will be bound or forbidden in heaven or in the spiritual realm. And whatever you loose or permit on earth will be loosed or permitted in heaven. Now, in context, you can take this verse and compare it with 
with the same verse in other Gospels. And what is is saying is heaven is the spiritual world and earth is the physical world. Now, I know this all may seem complicated and confused here at this point, but let me say this. Your answer, the answer to your problem is in the spirit world. The answer to your problem, whatever it is, whether it's physical, emotional, financial, confusion, a broken heart, whatever it is, your answer is in the realm of the spirit. Now, the key is to be able to reach into the realm of the spirit and apprehend what it is you need and bring it back into the realm of the physical so that it's profitable for you here in this realm. See, look, we're promised a lot of things as Christians. We're promised prosperity. We're promised health and healing. And I've heard so many people, and I grew up in churches where, where they said, yeah, that's, that's the way it's going to be. That's all. We're going to have that in heaven. No, 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 listen to me. You don't need healing in heaven. You don't need to be blessed with prosperity in heaven because in the heavenly realm, in our eternal future, prosperity and health and healing are just something that's a natural part of who you are. I mean, let's, let's get real. In heaven, asphalt is gold. So, there will be no need for anything that you can't have and won't be freely given in your eternal life. God when, when he speaks of health and healing, he's talking about now. Jesus even said one time, not only in the age to come, but in this age. So what is it that you need now? And let's clarify something. Why would you need anything now? Reality is to enhance your ability to promote the kingdom of God. If you are in the hospital with tubes hanging out of you, and you're barely hanging on, how many people are you going to minister to? And don't give me that old line, well, God put me in the hospital so I could minister to that nurse. <laughs> no, that nurse goes to Walmart too. Let God take you to Walmart instead of putting you in the hospital. God doesn't make you sick in order to teach you or to train you. He said that he had to Peter. He said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, the person with the keys is the person in charge. You don't believe me? Just go down to the county jail. The one with the keys is in charge. And the one with the keys decides who gets in and who gets out. Well, you have been given the keys to the kingdom and whether you want to admit it or not, you are the one who decides what gets in your kingdom and what gets out of your kingdom. You're, you're the one, you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you've been given spiritual keys. And you decide what comes from the realm of the spirit and what doesn't come from the realm of the spirit. And you activate that daily, consistently. And you're probably thinking right now, but how do I do that? What is it that I'm doing that's either locking or unlocking things? Proverbs 4.20 My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. <clears throat> what is life to all that find them and health to all their flesh? What is it? He said, his words. Keep my words. <clears throat> we are told that his words are the words that should come out of our mouth. And what we say 
is the way we lock and unlock things in the realm of the Spirit. And you may, once again, you may think, how can that be? It's just the spiritual law. And reading the Bible in context reveals that. You know, Jesus said we were going to look at this verse, but for sake of time, I'll just tell you right now. Jesus said that the same things that he did, we would do. <clears throat> the only difference is we'd do greater things. Like, whoa, <laughs> greater things than Jesus? Hello. I just want to kind of like get to the same things at least. Now, he said greater things. And people are saying, well, if I'm going to do the works that Jesus did, how, how do I do them? Well, if you want to do what Jesus did and have the results that Jesus had, you got to do what Jesus did. And Jesus said, I have not said anything. Now, he said this. I have not said anything unless the Father spoke it to me. And I haven't done anything unless the Father told me, spoke to me, and told me to do it. And I propose to you that me, you, and all of us here, and a lot of people everywhere, we've done a lot of things God hasn't told us to do. And, that's, and we've said a lot of things God hasn't told us to say. I mean, it happens all the time. This last week, I had two or three times where people came up to me and said, you know, I know I'm not supposed to say this, but... And, and one of them, I stopped, and I said, wait. If you're not supposed to say it, you know you're not supposed to say it, then don't say it. Oh, man, that stirs up stuff in people. They go, well, yeah, I, I, know, I know, but... I know I shouldn't say this, but you need to hear it. No, 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 no. If you shouldn't say it, then I don't need to hear it. Because all that you're doing is trying to make yourself feel better. I mean, is that the definition of gossip? And sometimes we use prayer as an excuse. John, in a normal conversation, I wouldn't tell you this. But I got something I want you to pray about. Phil's a mess. <laughs> and I know you're wondering, how's he a mess? Well, just so you'll know how to pray. Let me tell you some of the stuff Phil has done. So you can pray better. You don't want to pray wrong, right? That's why we have praying in the Spirit. That's why in Romans 8.26 it says sometimes you need to pray, but you don't know how to pray as you ought. So we let the Spirit within us pray with groanings that can't be understood by us, but they're being understood by God. And it goes on to say in verse 27, when we do that, we're praying the will of God. Then 1 John 5, 14 says, when we pray the will, this is the confidence we have in him. When we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And then verse 15 says, and if he hears us, and if we know he hears us, he grants the request. So what's more important? Praying the will of God or telling John about Phil? See, maybe... I just need to say, John, there's a situation going on with Phil. And I want you to agree with me in prayer for God's best for him. So uh, I, I, I can't tell you what it is going on. I shouldn't tell you, and I'm not going to. But just pray in the Spirit. Just pray in the Spirit concerning Phil. And when he does that, then what happens? God hears him. Somebody may say, well, you need an interpreter. No, God doesn't need an interpreter. You know, we're, that's about the gift of, of various kinds of tongues. And there's a difference between the gift of tongues and praying in the Spirit. Although to the outside person, they may seem the same. But trust me, God doesn't need an interpreter. So, how do we bind things? We bind them 
with our words. Jesus said this in John 6, 63. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are what? They are spirit and they are life. Hallelujah. Now, why, why were the words that he spoke to us spirit and life? Well, they were spirit because words are spiritual. But they are life. The words he spoke are life because he only spoke what the Father said. So we have to ask ourselves, the words we speak, they are spirit, but can you say they are life? Or do you have to say, well, they're life most of the time? Or they're life sometimes? Or I sure wish they would be life. See, you can lock up the enemy, or you can lock yourself up. You know what? You can have the keys and lock yourself in jail. And then throw the keys out. You know, here, here's the thing. You have the keys to the kingdom. You are the one who decides what comes out your mouth. See, and quit blaming somebody else for what you do. I mean, it's like the big old guy that's down at the bar and he's all crying and everything and he's half drunk. And, and the evangelist, this is supposedly a true story told to me by an evangelist one time. He said, I said to the guy, why are you drinking? He said, my wife makes me drink. He said, come on, your wife doesn't make you drink. He said, yeah, she does. I said, I know your wife. You know, you're like a football player type guy, and she's 110 pounds. What'd she do? Get her knee in your chest and get you down on the floor and pour that bottle in your mouth? He said, no, but she makes me drink. Evangelist said, let's go talk to her. So they went to talk to her. And she opened up the door, and after about five minutes, the evangelist said, pour me one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, <coughs> no, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the reality is, <laughs> you know, the, the reality is you are in charge of your mouth. <laughs> okay. Uh, Angels listen to words. Psalm 103, 19 and 20. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Now, when I've done my teaching on angels, we've gone through this extensively, so I, I, I'm not going to right now. But what you need to understand is the angels in the spirit realm. And they do exist. Angels are not mythological creatures. They, they are real. And they are here on the earth. There are probably angels dimensionally unseen, but in this room right now. And the angels are listening, according to that scripture, they are listening for the voice, voice, what's voice? They're listening for the voice of God's word. And his voice on this earth right now is going to be spoken through the body of Christ. And if you're a born again believer, you are the body of Christ. And so you are the ones, we are the ones who either speak his word or not. The angels are listening to hear God's word. When Jesus spoke, he spoke his father's word. What the father said, he said. When the angels hear it, the angels set about to do whatever needs to be done. When, when Jesus, now listen, when he was in Cain and, he, and, and he, he changed the water into wine, he did his first miracle after coming out of the wilderness. How did he change the water into wine? How did he do that? How did he do the things that he did? The woman with the issue of blood. How was it she got healed? What happened? She had, she had been to doctors for 12 years. Evidently, she was a, was a prosperous woman. Because to go to a doctor for 12 years and they didn't have Medicare... 
To go to a doctor in that era for 12 years meant spending money. And it said after 12 years, she finally ran out of money. So she must have had a lot of money. Paid doctors for 12 years. But she told Jesus, here's what she told him. She said she had heard about him. And she'd heard about how when people touched him, or he touched people, they were healed. And then she said, and then I said, she focused her faith. She said, if only I can touch him, I will be healed. And then she put action to it, touched him, and she was healed. I honestly believe that the reason that story is in the Bible is to tell us how faith works. She heard, she said, and she acted. Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the, it's not just hearing anything, it's hearing the word of God, hearing by the word of God. So faith is what happened to her. She heard. That's how it came. The way she activated it was she, and she says this in her story, talking to Jesus. She said, and then I said, she didn't just think it. She didn't just ponder it. She didn't act rashly. She spoke it. And when she spoke it, then she acted on it and she got it. Immediately she was healed. See, we need to listen for God's word and then not be so shy that we won't say it. A lot of people won't say the promises of God because they're thinking, well, what do I do if it doesn't happen? That's automatically, there's doubt. Right? The very fact that you're thinking it may not happen, so you've got to have a backup plan Let's the spirit realm know that you don't really believe completely in your heart. Remember Mark eleven twenty three. I know we can't get through a, a sermon without Mark eleven twenty three. But Mark eleven twenty three, Jesus said, "If you say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea." And you don't doubt, but you believe in your heart. What? What do you believe? Now look at the next phrase. You believe in your heart that the things you say will come to pass. But believes that those things he says will be done. Then what's the result? He will have whatever he thinks or whatever he wishes. No, he will have whatever he says. Well, I just don't want to put God on the spot. You're not putting God on the spot. You're on the spot. God's not on the spot. Oh, spot. That was my nickname at one time. I'll tell that story at a later date. Look at Genesis 11.6. Let's turn over to Genesis 11, 6. It's talking about the Tower of Babel. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing they propose to do will be withheld from them. Isn't that interesting? Verse 7. Come, let us go down. And there's a whole story on who the us is. Who's God talking to here? Let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another. In other words, break their communication. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there 
over the face of the earth, and they ceased building their city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, and yes, that's Babylon, the city that exists over there now, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. One of the sub-laws of the spiritual law of binding and loosing is the spiritual law of agreement. Once again, it can work for you. It can work against you. Be careful who you agree with. I have people say to me, Pastor, I want you to be in agreement in prayer with me. What are we believing for? Well, I can't say. Uh, okay. So am I agreeing that tonight when you try to murder your wife, it will be successful? What, what, what is it that I'm agreeing with here? No, no. Be careful who you agree with. Be careful who you allow to lay hands on you. Now, I know I have offended a few people, and in this particular area, I don't care. Not here, not here. But I've been, at, I've been at some conventions where somebody, I don't know who they are. I mean, I've never seen them before in my life. And they come up, and they say, I just feel led to lay hands on you and pray for you. And they start to put their hands out, and boom, man, get your hands off my head. If somebody's going to lay hands on me, it's got to be somebody I trust. Somebody I know where they are spiritual, because another spiritual law is contact and transfer. And if you start reading about the law of laying on of hands, the spiritual law of laying on of hands, you'll watch who you let lay hands on you. You don't just let any old yay who come up and lay hands on you. For those of you watching overseas, we're broadcasting from the Ozarks, and the word, the word yehu, I don't have a clue what it means, but my grandma used it a lot, so I apologize. Binding and loosing. What you bind... When I get in my car and I begin to travel somewhere, if my daughter is with me and she doesn't do it first, and man, that girl is a prayer. But before we get out of the driveway, there's some prayer going on. In the name of Jesus, I bind the forces of darkness. And I call forth the Word of God. And I say that on this trip, nothing shall harm us. I plead the blood of Jesus over this car, door handle to door handle and bumper to bumper. And I say, in the name of Jesus, there will be no accident, there will be no incident. I speak to my body in the name of Jesus, and I proclaim what the Word of God says. I have been healed by the stripes of Jesus, and while I travel, there will be no sickness befall me. I will not get nauseous, I will not get dizzy. I will, I will not have any physical problems on this trip. I thank you, Lord, in advance for the safety from the time we leave here to we get there, and I thank you, Father, that the trip will be profitable. And there may be a few more things we add in or whatever, but what are we doing? We're speaking into the realm of the Spirit, and we're calling those things back into this realm. That's what happens with healing. I proclaim by the stripes of Jesus, that I have been healed. According to 1 Peter 2, 24, I have been healed. By, by his stripes, I have been healed. And if I have been healed, I am healed. And somebody says, well, you don't look healed. I say, I may not look healed to you, but I am healed to me. And the attack that has come against my body, I rebuke it. And I cast it down and I say, it has no place, it has no legal place in me. There, legally, it has no place in me. And so I rebuke it. And you say, well, did it go? Well, it has to. It may, not, it may not just scamper off at that very moment. 
But all of a sudden now things are heading in a healing direction. And sometimes you get so busy with things that you allow things to go on for a long time and you use excuses that other people give you. Well, Phil, at the weight you're at, that's kind of a natural sickness. <laughs> By the stripes you have been healed. If you weigh more than 120 and less than 210, and you're between the ages of 16 and 39. Is that what the Bible says? Or does it just promise us that whatever state we're in, whether we're tall, short, dark, light, long-armed, short-armed, whatever, we're promised healing? Yeah. yeah, but when you get old, when you get old, you just get old. Old is nothing more than a number. It's just a number. How old are you? People say, do you like telling people how old you are? It doesn't matter to me. I'm 74. <laughs> and what does that mean? Absolutely nothing. Well, are you going to slow down? Yes, I like to rest. But you know what? The Bible says that we should take a, a Sabbath day rest regardless of what age you are. So you spunky young'uns out there at 20 and 25 that think you can work nine days a week, the Scripture says, the Scripture says that if you don't let the land rest, and we're just made out of dirt, by the way, if you don't let the land rest one year every seven years, break it down one day every seven days, if you don't let the land rest, eventually the land's just going to go on a rest. <laughs> oh, I feel the love coming. <laughs> oh, man. And I'm going to touch on this one last spiritual law under the law of binding and loosing. And I saved it for last because it's usually the one where people throw tomatoes. If they're going to throw tomatoes, it's usually this law. And it's the spiritual law of forgiveness. Matthew 6.14 For if you forgive men their trespasses, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. What about verse 15? Uh, can we just, just take your magic marker and let's mark that verse out right now. No, you can't do that. But if you do not forgive men your, their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses, trespasses. See, that can also be a subset to the spiritual law, and I just didn't have time to get into it today, but the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. What you sow is what you harvest. If you sow corn, you're going to harvest corn. You don't sow corn and harvest watermelon. You don't sow forgiveness and reap unforgiveness. No, you sow forgiveness. You harvest forgiveness. And that's a big deal. And if uh, somebody says, well, I just can't forgive them, why not? Well, I've been talking to some of my friends, and I've been thinking about this, and, and I, just, I just can't forgive them. Well, get new friends. Quit listening to those people. Start listening to the Lord. Who are you listening to? Who are you listening to? You know, this, this law of binding and loosing, of sowing and reaping, and, and the law of love, and the law of spiritual law of forgiveness, these laws are affected by who you're listening to. See, if you come to this church, 
Every now and then you're going to hear about forgiveness enough that if you go to this church very long, after a while you're going to start feeling like you need to forgive people. It has to do with what you listen to. And what you listen to a lot of times has to do with who you're hanging around with. Now, it's okay to minister to people. It's okay to minister to people who are negative. Okay? It's okay to minister to people who are negative. It's okay to minister to people who are lost. It's okay to talk to people who are in sin. I mean, Jesus ate with the Republicans and the sinners. I'm sorry. Je- Jesus, Jesus, Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners. Okay? He did. And he got criticized for it. But when he went in to minister someplace, he took Peter, James, and John. He didn't take the sinners. In fact, he put them out. And I think sometimes... As much as we don't want to admit it, we need to take some people who are speaking into our life and analyze what they're speaking. And if they're not speaking something that parallels the Word of God, we need to maybe put them out a little bit. Start start adjusting who you listen to. You know, you say, well, it's just water cooler work down it. Well, don't go to the water cooler then. I mean, it, it's as simple as somebody at the water cooler tells a dirty joke and, and, and you're a Christian, so you just got to go, <laughs> and you walk away and think, man, they shouldn't have told that. No, don't laugh. You say, well, what do I do? Just say, if, if you feel this way in your heart that that's not right, there may be other people wanting you to stand up. Somebody needs to stand up. Some, I've, I've actually been in places where somebody's told a dirty joke and, and I didn't laugh. They say, why didn't you laugh? I say, I don't appreciate it. I say, well, they're not going to be your friend anymore. Well, don't let the door hit you on the way out. I don't need friends who hang around me telling me dirty jokes. Cursing. Constant cursing. I don't, I don't want to hear it. If I do hear it, am I going to cry? No. We all hear things. We all see things. But you know what I'm talking about. The words that you consistently hear will eventually get inside of you. They'll consistent, if you consistently hear That's why you need to consistently stay in the Word of God. And not make the scripture something that you only see on Sunday. Forgiveness. Oh, yes. Do you love the Lord? Okay. Do you love me? Okay, good. Forgiveness means to absolve from payment or to cancel a debt. You go to the bank and they say, we're going to forgive this loan. What do they mean? They're going to cancel it. It's gone. And the next time you go to the bank, they don't look at you like, you owe us. No, it's canceled. It's gone. When you forgive somebody, it needs to be canceled. You forgive them. Of what? Of what they did that was bad. But it was really bad. It was really, I know. That's why you need to forgive them. If it wasn't bad, you wouldn't need to forgive them. You are forgiving them. Now listen to me. You are forgiving them because what they did was so wrong. It was awful. It was horrible. It was hurtful. It was mean. They did it. They acted like a jerk. But you forgive them. If you keep bringing it up, you haven't forgiven them. You say, yeah, but they owe me. They owe me. No, not if you forgive the debt. They don't owe you. And let me tell you something. They can't repay you anyway. As I've shared many times before, years ago, we used to have a lady that went to this church. She was 13. She was raped by her uncle. 
And she came into my office one day and we were talking and she said, and we talked about it many times, but finally one day she just said, well, he owes me. He owes me. I said, well, where is he? Let's just go see him. She said, well, he's dead. He's been dead for like 40 years or something. Because this lady was up in her late 60s at the time. And all of her life, she'd been harboring this. She said, he owes me. And she used those words, he owes me. I said, well, where, where is he? He's dead. I said, where? She told me the cemetery. I said, well, I'm going to go get a shovel. Let's just go dig that guy up, rattle his bones. Let's just, I'll let you grab him by the neck and you can say, you owe me. <laughs> yeah. Then she started laughing. See, here's the whole thing. The people that owe you, they can't repay you. He couldn't repay her. There's nothing. He may owe her, but he's dead. And, and people who owe you because they've done something wrong, they're kind of bankrupt in a way themselves. They can't pay you back. When you, when you start looking at how you can get paid back, then you haven't really forgiven. All right. <laughs> You've got to speak forgiveness into existence, or the forgiveness won't exist. Okay, repeat after me. I forgive my pastor, forgive my pastor. for anything he's done against me, real or perceived. I forgive him now in the name of Jesus. See? Doesn't it feel good? I'm still just like what I was. But you feel better. Right? Okay, now, think about somebody next who has hurt you. Don't dwell on this too long. But Because but, I don't want anybody, I know we got people in here that are packing. I don't want any guns coming out. But think about somebody Seriously, who has hurt you, who you really, you just don't like them at all. And if you had your way, and maybe nobody would ever find out, you might just do something that would eliminate them from the face of the earth. Nobody would find out. Nobody, nobody would know, just you. Now, that person, whether you want to admit it or not. Now, this doesn't mean that they're not a jerk. This doesn't mean that they're not an idiot. This doesn't mean that they're not mean. And they may be living or they may be dead. They may be young or they may be old. They may be a family member or not. But if you're harboring that deep down inside of you, and it comes up every so often, it'll mess up your life. It can cause you, listen, a scientific journal actually said, and I know this is true because I read it on the internet. <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> it said that stress caused by grief, caused by unforgiveness, and, and stress caused by hatred would actually shorten a person's life 20%. Because when, when you are thinking about that, you tense up, don't you? I've been there. I've been there. I remember many, many, many years ago laying in bed thinking about this guy. I was thinking, I might just befriend him. And after a couple of years, invite him to go deer hunting. And then I would just say, well, I was just climbing over the fence and it went off. Uh, <laughs> And that was a deal for me, because that guy had hurt my family. I said, he had hurt my family in a severe way. And somewhat, sometimes it's not your offense, it's the offense you take on for somebody else you love. And that guy had hurt my family. He hadn't hurt me. He hurt my, he hurt my mom and dad really bad. And I just wanted that guy off the face of the earth. And then the Lord started dealing with me. And that's when I got the revelation, Jesus died for him just like he died for me. It's like, oh boy, how am I going to handle that? There's only one way. Forgive him and move on.
Is that guy still alive now? That's been 40 years, 35, 40 years. Is he still alive? Yeah, he's still alive. Is he still a jerk? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? It, it just, I got to be honest, it is one of the freshest feelings that there is. If you can truly just let something go and forget it. So, right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I forgive, silently say the name. Now ask yourself, did I lie to the Father? Did I really forgive Him? Or did I just go through emotion? No, you've got you to forgive. Well, you know, Peter must have really had somebody he was messing with. Because he said, if a brother sins against me, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive him? And Jesus said, seven times 70. And I can see Peter thinking, okay, that's 490. Okay, I'm waiting for that 491st time. I'm going to take him out fishing. That's what Peter was thinking. I'm going to take him out fishing, and I'm going to say, hey, I saw Jesus walk on water. Why don't you try it? <laughs> but what you've got to understand is <laughs> 490 was a idiom. It was a phrase that was used at the time of Jesus that meant the same thing as we would say a million times. How many times do I need to forgive them? A million times. In other words, it meant there is no end to it. It's just a, an, an infinity number. In other words, you just keep on forgiving. Well, you know, I haven't seen that guy. Honestly, I haven't seen him in probably 10 or 12 years. But what would I do today if I go through the drive through at McDonald's to get my quarter pounder with onions only and I happen to notice he's in the car in front of me in a nice new Mercedes convertible hair all slicked back looks like he just got back from Hawaii and I see that guy what am I going to do? absolutely nothing just get my quarter pounder and Drive down the road. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do if somebody approaches you? You know, you can be cordial. Does it mean I have to make that man my friend? No, I'm not going to make him my friend. I don't want to be friends with him. Scripture doesn't say I have to be friends with him. It doesn't mean I have to bring him over to my house. It doesn't mean I have to flag him down if I see him and say, Hey, come on, I'll buy you a quarter pounder. No. It just means in my heart, it's just neutral. And honestly, I, I got to be honest with you because I've been there. And I wasn't exaggerating when I said 40 years ago I had those thoughts. I mean, I got them out of my head real quick, but I had those thoughts. But it's so much better to be on the forgiveness side. And somebody says, well, what about him? Well, anything about him is between him and the Lord. Hmm. Now, I'm going to just close with this. There's some other spiritual laws, and I'm sure we'll get into those. But one last thing on forgiveness. You've got to forgive yourself. I said, you've got to forgive yourself. Too many people are living with regret, with guilt, because you know what you did, sometimes it's like 20 years ago, or 30. Maybe last week, maybe it was this morning, I don't know. But you know what you did. And usually it's something that happened a long time ago, and you just feel guilty about it. Because you know that way back there, you hurt somebody. You hurt them bad. And you did something you should not have done. And you cut them. And they're still hurting, probably 20-some years later. And they 
they are still hurting from it. And you're okay, but they're hurting from it. You're okay, but you you still have the guilt. Every now and then that thought comes up. Man, I wish I had that. I feel so awful. Well, it's time to quit feeling awful. It's time to practice the art of forgiveness on yourself. <laughs> And I tell you what, I don't think any of us, any of us, I know there were people I hurt when I was younger. Maybe I hurt somebody unintentionally recently. I don't know. But I, I know that there were some people when I was younger that I did some stupid stuff. But to, when you forgive yourself, it's just so nice. So just put your hand on your heart right now. Just say, Father... In the name of your son, Jesus, I forgive myself for the stupid stuff that I've done, for the people that I've hurt, for the places I've been I shouldn't have been. Thank you, Father, because your word says that if I forgive someone, then you forgive me, and I forgive others and I forgive myself. Why did we have to say that? Because that's the way the spiritual law of binding and loosing works. You have the keys. The keys are in your mouth. It is your voice that gives word to the angels. It is your voice that goes to the throne room of God. It is your voice that binds and looses. It's your voice. If you're a born-again believer, if you're a born-again believer, you have been given power and authority over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. And context is if you use the authority that has been given to you. Let's stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We submit to you, and Father, we thank you that you have given us the keys to the kingdom. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen.